it's questionable who's the first. There's a lot of people that, are the, that, 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 that try to lay claim to that. But Henry Danlos was a physician in Paris who was loaned a, a radioactive source or, or a radium tube by the Curies. And he treated a superficial lesion in 1901. So this is considered one of the first uses. So from, from there, radium took off as the radionuclide of choice. There weren't a lot of radionuclides to choose from at that point. Uh, it was the radionuclide. So there were lots of different ways to apply it. They made needles, and here are some capsules uh, that were used to either implant and, 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 or sometimes pack on the outside. So brachytherapy, uh, which we've, we've got a large group with a lot of different languages, but the word Brachytherapy comes from Greek, or brachy, which means short, and it, it's, it's all about the distance between the, the target and the source. And here are some, here are some creative ways that radioactivity have been, has been used to treat breast cancer over the years, and this, this, this is from 1927. So you can see some, some needles following the, 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 lymph, the lymph chain. Also, we have some needles crossing directly into a tumor. And then, and then packing all superficial. So, until, until really, until the we discovered the fission and and created reactors, we didn't have a lot of other isotopes to, to play with. But once reactors came on by, online, uh, a lot of other radioisotopes were were discovered. Big ones being cobalt and cesium. So cobalt is formed via activation of cobalt-59, where a neutron um, is absorbed and it, it, and it changes, transmutates into an isotope. Cesium-137 is, is made from the splitting of the uranium atom, so it's fission. So the, both of those were introduced in the 50s after reactors started to come online. Later on in the, in the 60s, iridium-192 was started to be produced. And it's produced in the same way as cobalt-60. It's produced through neutron activation. So a, ne uh, a neutron is absorbed by the nucleus of, of iridium-191 and becomes iridium-192. So wire sources were very popular and, and they kind of took, that's 1960s is when finally uh, there was a transition away from, from radium. And later on in, in the 1970s, remote afterloading became a, an option and became a feature and became something that, that was more and more used. So radioactivity, uh, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. So radioactivity, it's the spontaneous release of radiant energy from unstable atoms. So you've got, a, you've got an atom that, that's, that's unstable due to its, typically it's, it's the, the constituents in the nucleus. There's either too many protons or too many uh, neutrons. And so to get rid of some of that energy, it's released in different ways. It can be released as alpha particles, beta, which are releasing nuclear particles to, to protons, to neutrons, beta, electro, kicking out an electron, um, gamma, uh, which is a photon, or in, in some cases, californium, one natural case, a neutron can be released. So, rivity is the, the event. So, the, the, the actual, it's kind of a, it's saying that these are unstable atoms. How do you measure that? You don't, you're not measuring the instability, you're, what, you're, what you're measuring is the number of atoms that are present. And the, the, the first unit of activity was based off of the radiation from one gram of radium. And, and going back to um, earlier in the history, radium was the only um, game in town. So it makes sense that that's the standard that everything was based off. Later on, when we've as we've switched to SI units and tried to unify nomenclature, we introduced the Baccarel, and that's now the standard. And that's one disintegration per second. It, it's so this is the new uh, standard and the conversion is is based off of the the old one gram of radium 3.7 times 10 to the 10 disintegrations per second so radium is part of a chain it's part of a decay chain so we talked about you know radioactivity is this these unstable atoms 
it's a whole there's a whole series of them radium is is just a, a decay product or or a downward daughter great 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 granddaughter of uranium and this is another thing that we need to that's a that's a characteristic of each atom or each isotope is its half life so there there are some correlates between the the amount of instability and, and its half life in terms of if if it's a if it's a really unstable atom, it's got a really short half life because it, it it's got to get it's got to reach that um, stable point quickly. The, the important thing is that this is just a, a fundamental characteristic of, of of each isotope is its its half life, and that's that's related to the decay constant, which can be used to plot the half life uh, using an exponential equation that I think we're most of us are, or all of us are familiar with. So, so as the new isotopes became available in the 50s, people only, the only evidence or, or the experience that they had was with radium. So to create a treatment with a different isotope, they needed to convert between isotopes. So the Conversion process is, is, is relatively straightforward. It's based on the exposure rate constant. How many, how many photons are being kicked out and how many, ver so how much energy or how much is being released relative to each other. So here we have exposure rate constants the, with the big gamma. So 8.25 Rankins, and, we'll, and we're gonna talk about these units, the Rankins per centimeter squared. Uh, or Rankin centimeter squared per millicurie hour. So if you wanted to convert from a radium to iridium, you would create a ratio. So it's a, it's a, it's a straightforward ratio between the two exposure rate constants. Uh, and that creates a correction factor. That's very common in pretty much everything we do is creating a ratio to create a correction factor. So, and there's some examples written here um, showing the conversion of, of different activities to different or from my different isotopes. So this is an important, this is an important element. I mean, it's important to learn from our past. And if we want to uh, glean some knowledge from the, the medical li literature of yesterday, we need to be able to convert and to, and, and normalize to the units we use today. So that we, the, the discussion into, into units, and we talked about the units of activity in terms of na being named after other physicists who helped first discover uh, radioactivity in terms of the, the Curies and, and Baccarel. And there's also the Rankin, which is a unit of exposure. This is, this, I, got a, I have a picture here of Rankin's wife. You don't see that very often, but most people are familiar with the, the radiograph um, next to her, and that's her hand. So. And that's this picture of Rankin uh, is, was shortly before his death. But when he first discovered that there was something developing his film, he, he actually asked his wife to come over and put, his, put her hand down and then exposed the film. So behind every, uh, every, someone, uh, but behind every famous some, uh, person, there's, there's some support people. And Anna Bertha was his uh, support. So Rankin is based, it used to be a, an older unit, one electrostatic unit. And, and again, a, a move towards uh, standardization uh, um, of units. The Rankin has fallen completely out of favor because it's based off of uh, a non-fundamental unit, this electrostatic unit. So moving to coulombs per kilogram, which are SI units, we have 2.58 times 10 to the negative four. Uh, this can be used to, this can be used or a measurement of, of, of exposure of, of how much radiation is being emitted can be used to convert for to how much energy is being deposited if you know the average energy to create an ion pair in, in the case of air it's, it's about 33.4 these other these values have been well studied and tabulated for different tissues we have uh, we get what we call a, an F factor Peter, which, Peter, yeah. can I interrupt you just for a second yeah. Peter sure it appears that your the PowerPoint slides are cut a little bit. All the words I just talked to Samiksha, and she's not seeing all of you there. Where is it cut? 
sort of around around the four edges like it's just all that all the outside of it is cropped just a little bit like i don't see the bottom equation oh so you don't see the one rank in equals 0.876 i think it's a scale or zoom ratio no, don't see that. your screen um, can, can everyone else see the whole screen Um, I tell you what, Peter. Why don't you play play the just play the PowerPoint, um, not in the actual. Do it in the like if you end you know, the, the non presentation. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, just do it like that. You know, so everyone can see. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thank. You. Does that work? Yeah. Thank thank you, Adam. That's that's yeah. yeah thank you. So this is just showing the the basic conversion of uh, Rankins into into gray using an F factor, and that's based off of the the ionizations based on the amount of energy that's deposited. So let me. This is a little different. I think I can do that. Right. So getting into units, the energy deposition. So Rankins a, a unit of exposure. Dose is what we're really interested in. not just how many photons there are, but how many photons are depositing energy. And that's a two-step process. So first, there's an, an incoming photon. It interacts at a point, and, that, and that, at that point, it may be scattered, and, but also electron created. And those electrons deposit their energy through Coulombic interactions. So that first, that first interaction point the energy that's, that's, that's not deposited but released is called karma. So karma is the, the energy transferred per unit mass. So how, how much energy um, is released at that point? The next, the next step is the, how much energy is deposited. Uh, and that, that deposition occurs uh, again, through the, those electrons who have uh, Coulombic interactions or, or collisional interactions with other electrons. And then sometimes it's, sometimes it's also re-irradiated re as, as Bremsstrahlung. Sometimes those, those, those electrons are going fast enough to Bremsstrahlung. It's, it's, it's not a concern, not at these energies. At higher energies, yes, but, but um, not, a, not for brachytherapy which simplifies things, because karma essentially is equivalent to dose for brachytherapy. So we, we've talked a lot about like how the units have evolved, or the names, how the names of the, the evolved. They all started with these names of physicists, and now, have, I mean, Baccarat is still named after a physicist, but they're moving towards fundamental units. And karma is a much, a uh, more fundamental unit than a Rankin. So recently, not too long ago, I mean, in, in my career, we, we started with, Cur with Curies, and now we've, and we moved to quantifying things with Becquerel, and now we're actually moving to air karma strength, which is an even more fundamental unit. And you can see here, uh, this, these different, re well, it's, it may, they may be a little um, difficult to read, but these are different, certificates for, for radioactive sources. This is a, a test for a source, a certificate for a source, and then what's in your true implanting system. And each of them, they use air karma strength, but they use them with slightly different magnitudes. So in terms of whether it's milligray or centigray. And so the, those are things that, subtleties that we should pay attention to because a misplaced decimal point can be important. Be tragic. So 10 curies, it's about 40,823 centigrade um, centimeter squared per hour. And so this is a, just a good conversion to, to know. Um, so I'm actually gonna jump to this one real fast and then I'll, and then I'll go to the other ones. So we we're, we talk about quantifying the the talk about quantifying the activity and quantifying the the number of emissions. This is this is important because this is essentially this is our this is the strength or this is the field strength. This is where the field strength comes from. So for a percent depth dose for a, an iridium source, it's very close 
to a, the inverse square law. So here we have a, a picture from uh, a graph from Khan showing the, or plotting uh, iridium and one over r squared. We also have cobalt and, and some other um, isotopes on here. But iridium is almost completely overlapped, or it is overlapping with the one over r up to 7 cm in the graph. And, and the inverse square, you know, we all know this is just a geometric. So as, as, the, as the source and, and the photons spread out, less photons are incident to a unit area. So with radiation therapy, most of our radiation interactions occur in the, in the Compton region. So they're, they're, they're the main different interaction types, the photoelectric, Compton and pair production. For radiation therapy, it's, it's, it's all Compton. And, then, and then here we have a, a graph kind of showing, showing that. So I bring that up and I, and I highlight that because it's the scattering. So Compton scattering results in, in, in photoing in, in lots of different directions. And, and that's why the inverse square is, is a good approximation. So as a, in a typical photon beam, if, if you're thinking about, about external beam therapy, uh, after the buildup region, there's this steady decrease in dose. With iridium, it's, it's kind of a flat line of dose. So this black line is the primary dose. So it's essentially, the dose isn't necessarily decreasing per point. The only thing that's, that's, that's changing is the number, of, the number of photons incident to that unit area. So we, again, we go back to the inverse square. And, and that's because of the buildup of, of scatter. So as the primary dose, which looks, this blue line looks just like a, a depth dose curve, a typical depth dose curve. As that's going down, we've also got the buildup of single scatter events and multiple scatter events, which, in, which increases the, the total scatter dose. And it pretty much accounts for that reduction in primary dose. So we've got this flat line up top. This is also illustrated and from in this picture from Khan, where these, these are all different isotopes. And here you see iridium-192, it's a flat line. So it's a, it's a dose to, at a distance versus the, the initial dose. It's a flat line and it probably goes, uh, goes almost, it's like it goes all the way up to like it's seven or eight or nine again, but it's a flat line, which is very helpful. It means that we don't have to worry too much about the the complex interactions when we're at a short distance, which is where brachytherapy is. It's, 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 at, the, it's at a close range. Uh, Peter, can I interrupt yeah. you for a minute? Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a good um, stopping point and we'll answer some questions right now. And then we'll have one more stopping point in a little bit where we'll answer some more questions. So you guys can think about some questions that you have. While you're thinking about a couple of questions, I just want to reiterate a couple of things that Peter said because I think they are very important. So on this, this slide where he's on, the two graphs that you're looking at, the, at the inverse square is factored out. So that's an important just uh, thing to understand. So when he's talking about the flat line of dose, that's where the, the inverse square is, is factored out. So if you're not talking about that, then um, the dose at a distance of say six or seven centimeters is the same as the dose at one centimeter for iridium 192 and hence um, when you do factor in the inverse square um, iridium 192 behaves almost exactly like inverse square up to eight or nine cm peter can you go back to slide one back one slide please yeah yeah and so when he shows this graph this is one of the most important concepts i think for you all to take home today from this portion of Peter's presentation is this uh, for cobalt 60 and iridium 192, how closely it follows inverse square. And that exactly is the reason why brachytherapy is so important. So there's a reason that say for gynecological cancer, we're treating up to 90, 95 gray total EQD2. Uh, we'll get into that terminology later, but it's a, it's a lot of dose. Right, and there's no one that can give 
95 gray or 100 gray or 105 gray to cervical cancer with the most sophisticated external beam equipment. You can't do it with CyberKnife. You can't even come close. And the reason is because something like CyberKnife, which is very sophisticated, still has a very gradual fall off of dose um, delivered externally. But when you put those sources right up close to the tumor and it falls off with this inverse square approximation, you get that rapid, rapid fall off, which leads to dose escalation and hence the importance of brachytherapy. So this will be a, a common theme in a lot of our presentations. So make sure that uh, you understand that. Do we have any questions uh, from anyone? You can type it to me or, or say it, or if you don't, we can move on. Okay, no problem. So Peter will continue. And uh, if you have other questions, again, feel free to write to us and, and we'll have a, another break. and We'll answer questions at the very end as well. Uh, thank you, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Adam. And it's, it's, and it's, it is important to, to, to highlight those, those items. A lot of this should have been review. I think a lot of this, for, uh, most of us are, are practicing professionals, so we've gone through this, but it's important that we have a starting point. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move into the technology. So afterloaders, these are the three major, after, uh, the, the three main ones. There's the, Lect the, the Flexitron from Lecta, the new Bravos from Varian, and the multisource from Eckert and Ziegler or Bbig. And, and I, that's, that one's got a lot of potential and we'll, we'll discuss that more. So we'll also talk about the source characteristics, physical and the dosimetric, but this is both for Iridium and for Cobalt-60. And then the treatment planning algorithms, the basis of TG43, and then the newer algorithms that do heterogeneity correction, although we won't go into too, too much detail, just kind of the importance of it and, and the fact that this is a new development on the scene. And then, we'll, and then also applicators. So here we have a, a nice table that, that, that shares kind of the, the features of the different manufacturers. So the Varian's got three. I'm not sure if they're going to sell all three of them anymore. But we can see that the, the, source, the sources are all about the same for, for all the manufacturers. Um, the, the MAC cycles are different. But with a routine service, the, the, again, the, it's relatively the same. The, the diameter of the needles, also the same. The, the way that the cables are, are constructed. So what I'm really getting at is, is these, these units are, uh, even though they might have different features, they're still the same. They're, they're, and that's what I'll get to. Except for one, one, one thing that, that before I leave this, Let's go to that bottom one is the step motion. And I think that one is probably the biggest thing that, that you're gonna wanna be aware of about your unit. And if you work with another unit to ensure that, that you're aware of how the wire moves by the, by the target. Does it go forward or does it go backward? And we see we've got about a split. So Electa, who's, who's probably got one of the largest market shares, they push forward, the, the wire goes the, the wire and the treatment goes forward. With invariant, the wire extends all the way out and then pulls back in. So the again, that, that's that's the big I think subtlety between the different uh, between the units. The only other really difference between the units is the the fact that the Bebig and the Flexitron can use Cobalt 60, and we'll talk about Cobalt 60, but. That's been a pretty nice development. And, and Cobalt 60 was actually used for, for, for brachytherapy and for, for high dose rate brachytherapy. But there are issues, or there used to be issues, uh, with sore size. And you see the diameter of the interstitial needle, that's an important, that's an important thing. If, if, if you've got a larger um, needle, you're gonna have more inflammation. Is that, is that clinically favorable? And it's, it's not. So making micro sources of cobalt has been a, a really nice development. So like I said, these, these units are, are roughly, this is a, this is a micro selectron, but all these units operate in a, in a very similar way. They've got two wires, a live wire and a dummy wire. So you've got, so the dummy wire is, is exactly like the live wire, except for the live wire actually has a radioactive tip and that, 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 We'll sh I'll show you that, that, that radioactive tip in the, in, the, in the next slide. But 
the, the important thing is that there are these two, these two wires that go out um, and there are different encoders and, and ways to ensure that the, that how far the, or know how far the, the wire has been extended and know what channel the wire has been sent down. But they're, they're pretty straightforward machines and then, and then obviously a safe. Here we've got the whole unit with some source, some source guide tubes or transfer guide tubes connected with, the, with an applicator uh, and showing an applicator in a patient. And this is a tandem and ring, which we'll um, discuss more later. Going, going to the source, it's, it's about the size of a grain of rice. And Eckerd and, and Ziegler, I'm not good at pronouncing that, but they, a cobalt source. And, and Eckerd and Ziegler is actually their source manufacturer that, that provides sources for all the, the different vendors, which is interesting. So I'm not sure how many different source providers there are out there, but miniaturizing that cobalt 60 source, I, I believe was enough to motivate Eckerd and Ziegler to build their own afterloader. So there are some subtleties, are some subtleties between the Cobalt 60 and the Iridium 192. Their energies are different, for one. They're, they're, they're significantly different. But their exposure rate constant. Here, let me see. I couldn't see my I couldn't see my own table. So you see the mean energy is quite different. But the, the the, the exposure rate is not too far off. And with the same amount, or with, with a much smaller source of, of cobalt-60, you can reach almost the equivalent exposure rate with iridium-92. And so we've got these max exposure rate, uh, 400 centigrade per minute for the outcomes have been, have been good. But there are some radiobiological considerations with those different dose rates, uh, and I think that there, there there will be more studies on that. But the due to the the big difference with the cobalt sixty is its half life. It's five years versus three months, and 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 or no, it's not sorry, not three months, months. So it's massively different. So if you're in a limited resource setting, and it's hard to transfer sources, cobalt sixty is a very attractive alternative to Iridium-192. Then there are some shielding requirements that are different, but for the most part, the treatment, the treatments are equivalent. One subtlety, and, and this was, a, a, I think, an early criticism of the Cobalt-60 was, well, it, it takes longer to, to get the same, the same dose. Uh, Eckerd and Ziegler, this is based off of their source material, so they have, they have a, a bias in the way that it's presented. On average, the radiation is about 1.8 times longer with cobalt-60. So that's, that's based on the operation um, of one half-life of cobalt-60 and three months of iridium-192. So when the source is new, those, those treatments are pretty quick. The, length, the long lifetime of cobalt-60 means that near the end of its life, you are going to have to accommodate for that, that difference in irradiation time. So I think that's something that will have to be considered in terms of scheduling and, and your, your, your time blocks may change over time. So the, the sources themselves, it's interesting, with, with, even with their quite different energies, their distribution, the dose distribution is very similar. The, the one thing that, that, that should be uh, noted is that it does diverge a little bit from the inverse square. Iridium-182 really, really stayed on that line of one over R squared. Cobalt-60, there are some subtleties. So that'll, that'll just have to be accounted for in the, in the planning algorithm. But you see here, this, I think this, this source anisotropy cur uh, curve is great. It really shows that they almost completely overlap. The only thing is there's actually a little less anisotropy because it's not, a, it's not attenuated by the encapsulation as, as much as the Iridium-192. So it's, it's, it's a much more of a spherical source than Iridium-192, which has that kind of that, that butterfly appearance. 
but this is these are all these are all overlays showing that the that the cobalt six typically equivalent so there, there's not going to be a, a massive learning curve in terms of the the way that these uh, these treatments are prescribed it's just going to be time is going to be the big difference so going to how we determine the, the our treatments or how we plan our treatments the, the algorithms to uh, plot dose plot dose distributions tg43 is the gold standard and this is this has been around for a while uh, it uses polar coordinates and, and I got this, this little plot up here to show kind of a, a circle, and it's based off of the, the angle theta and the distance r from, from this central point. And that central point is, is, is the center of the, the radioactive source. So it's this, this bisector of the, of the radioactive source, and then everything kind of radiates out from that. So here is the equation of, of TG43. And it's it's pretty straightforward. I, I, I think it's it's maybe a little intimidating at first, but we have the the source strength, which is going to be dependent on on how many or how much activity you have. But we typically use a, no, a nominal value and then scale from there. The dose rate constant, which is just again a constant for that radioisotope, whether it's cobalt sixty or iridium one ninety two. Uh, a geometry function, which is actually a function of the the source itself, so the the which is the sh the shape of the the shape of the, of the source, the the length of the source, the width of the source. That that's um, what impacts the geometry function. Then the the radial dose function and the anisotropy function. And I'm going to back up to this previous slide because this shows the anisotropy. So the, the fact that it's not isotropic for iridium-192, but it's getting closer with cobalt-60. And the radial dose function, which is the, essentially the, the, the percent depth dose, or the, the dose at, at a distance. So that's the, the TG-43 equation. And, and, and there's going to be some people that are going get to get into this uh, on a much uh, higher out level. I'm just here to introduce you to the, the concept. This is, TG43 is kind of, is moving out of favor. Not that it's moving out of favor, but we're evolving beyond it. We're realizing that there's, there's more to uh, things than just, just applying the, the inverse square and these anisotropy functions and radio dose functions, which are acquired by, with Monte Carlo and water. And then we use tables to look, look up tables to, to calculate it. We're realizing that if we want to get fancy with our treatments, such as using a rectal shield so that you can put a cylinder um, and not treat the, the rectum, or, or, or you can. That's, that's not something you can do with TG43. You need, you need to do some heterogeneity corrections. And so there are different options. Monte Carlo is obviously the, the gold standard, but Varian now has their Acuros, which is the. It's a Boltzmann transport equation solver. It's a, it's a meaty word, but I think this, will, this stuff will come up more in, in the treatment planning lectures. But the big, the big thing is here, if you've got an in home injury, whether it's bone or it's lung, you're not accounting for that. You're not accounting for any kind of um, preferential attenuation. Acuros and, and Monte Carlo can both solve for those heterogeneities very well. And I liked this, this picture from the clinical brachytherapy physics, this, this last AAPM summer school, because it shows a cylinder and, and it shows a differential, or it shows, a, it shows a, a, a complex dose distribution. That's something that we could not calculate with TG43 alone. going to influence your applicator selection. So these are, there are lots of different fancy applicators and there, there are different needles for, inter, for, for interstitial treatments and surface applicators for superficial lesions. 
but dependent on the imaging system that you use, whether you're using conventional radiography or a CT or an MR, the, the applicator choice can greatly impact your ability to, to create a good plan. So we see here an, an, an older applicator that maybe was designed for use with radiographic film and, and used to, to show up really well on a 2D image, creates a lot of streaking and a lot of artifacts in, in a 3D. on a radiograph, but show up just fine and artifact free on uh, a volumetric image. And now the, the, the new shift is, is more information, better soft tissue contrast, so MR. And using MR, there are other considerations. Um, it, it could be any metal pieces, it's, it's all gonna be MR safe. And so if, that's what you have, you know, you have to be, you have to, that has to be a consideration uh, of your selection is, is. That was my brief introduction to the physics and technology. And now I'm going to jump over to. Uh, uh, hold, hold it there, Peter. We'll take, uh, this will be our last little break um, before um, moving on to the next uh, PowerPoint, which is a little bit shorter than this one. Yeah. So. I wanted to just reiterate to everyone that this is the overview. Peter's covering a lot of things, so a lot of things will be covered in, in greater detail later. We have an entire section session which only covers applicators, so you'll get uh, lots of detail on every type of applicator. So a lot of this is an introduction. So we'll answer some questions now. Um, I got one question message to me, which I can answer now. And then if anyone else has uh, questions, we can proceed with that. Peter, if you can just go back to the TG43 question, uh, a slide with yep. the equation. So someone texted in, is the dose rate constant different for each isotope? So again, this equation will be covered in a little bit more detail later. Yes, the dose rate constant is isotope specific. So this is a value that is done by experimentation or more commonly by Monte Carlo measurements. So they find for a given uh, source strength, for a given erichromis strength, you have X amount of dose at one cm away from the source at 90 degrees perpendicular from that source. And so it's a scalable thing. So if you have a wide number of erichromis strength, then your dose rate at that point would be that if you have Z number of error karma strength, then your dose rate would be higher or lower. So it's a constant, but it's specific to each source depending on the exact make of that source, the encapsulation, the size of it, the diameter, everything that goes into these uh, Monte Carlo or, or detailed experiments. So we cannot measure dose rate constants ourselves. It's a very complicated process. Uh, so we stick with the literature. And so later when we get to the treatment planning system commissioning topic, we'll explain exactly where you find those and we'll provide those documents for you. But that's something that's done by typically task groups in, in major organizations or, or by research papers that will give you this information. Yeah. Yeah, typically the, the manufacturer, I don't know if, so typically the manufacturer will eat either farm it out but the, or they will support the the tabulation of all these values and they will publish the the characteristics of their particular source with its encapsulation and and the volume and uh, i'll just expand just a tiny bit real quickly so this the the anisotropy factor and the radial dose functions again that is with the geometry factor removed so if you remember that previous slide where where we talked about the iridium-192 being almost constant for a number of cm, that was with the inverse square factored out, and same with uh, the geometry factor and the anisotropy factor. Um, so they're purely due to absorption and scatter, uh, removing um, the geometry factor. Yep. Uh, do we have any other questions from the group? Okay, so we can proceed. Peter, if you want to go on to your next presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Can you see this? Oh. Oh. 
Can you guys see this? Or is this visible? I still have it as the source characteristics from the previous uh, presentation. Let me try Slide this. Um, how about that? Yes, perfect. OK. I guess I'm, I'm not, I guess I, I thought I was sharing the screen. I'm just sharing the, the presentation, which is just fine. So we're going to talk about pairing. Prior planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance. So overview. So we, we, the big thing is the infrastructure. So having the right pieces in place. So what are the right pieces? The investments, what are the investments that you need to make? So where do you need to, to, to prepare to make those investments? And I, I think imaging is massive. So it, it's not, there are a lot of, there, there, are not, there are several options. It's just important that you select your option and, and then um, realize that it has a lot of consequences. The imaging, again, goes back to the applicators. So what applicators are you going to get? And, 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 and that really comes down to the imaging. And then location and layout, because this matters. This matters a lot. So here we have a, a nice picture of which what might be an, a really nice ideal treatment room. You've got an ultrasound in there. You've got the afterloader. You've got a C-arm for, for, for radiographs uh, and, a, and a treatment table. That's actually, that would be a pretty nice setup. But we don't we we don't all have we don't all have these kind of facilities. We 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 are constrained with the resources that we have available. So there's some operational factors to consider. Obviously, safety first. It's it's, it's really important to ensure that you that you're approaching this in a in, in a safe uh, manner. And there are good resources from the IEAE. This is one of them. Is the setting up a radiotherapy program. Fortunately, everyone in the on the call is already involved and they've already got a program, but building that program, it's important that it's done uh, in, a, in a very systematic way. So looking at you, what you have, your existing facilities in terms of space, and do you need to build uh, a new space or do you, uh, are there spaces that you can share? Those are things that you really need to, to look at. Obviously human resources, and this is, this is massive, and this is, a, this is the, Probably the largest expenditure and, and, and the largest investment. And, and I'm very happy that we're all investing in human resources right now. So the and then obviously the patient volume. Do you do you have the right case mix um, that's going to be well served by brachytherapy? It's, it's all great if, if you actually have the, the resources to, to create a brachytherapy program, but make sure that it's, it's going to be utilized. And obviously, here's a nice, here's a nice kind of uh, little graph of the, the utilization of, of HDR. And we see that cervix is cervical cancer. That's, that's, that's the, one of the, probably one of the largest use cases for a brachytherapy. And, and places where HPV is prevalent, this is, this is a great tool. So the, regarding the infrastructure, there's, there's a couple of um, clinical steps that you should dial in on. Uh, there, there are four main steps in the, in the delivery. So there's the, or the, the treatment itself. There's the applicator placement, there's the imaging, there's the treatment planning, and then there's the treatment delivery. And, and where these items are performed and whose responsibility it is to perform each of these items, it's very important to have outlined and, and written down and, and agreed upon. So th this is actually a, a nice procedure. This is a one medical physicist model of a HDR procedure flow uh, from TG59. Uh, and it, it, we've got a dosimetrist in this, a physicist, a nurse, a radiation oncologist, uh, and a technologist. So it's a, it's a team, it's a team event. So all this costs money. And, and what is that, how much how much money? Well, it depends on your, your local area. This is, this is from a presentation in the United States. So these are for U.S. dollars, but this is what it would cost 
cost. This is what it would cost us in the States to start a whole new program. So it's, it's, it's not insignificant. I think brachytherapy is one of the more cost-effective modalities. It's, it's probably the most cost-effective modality, uh, especially in terms of uptime too. The, 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 the sources don't not work. Every once in a while there are, there are failures and we, we guard against those. But a, a brachytherapy unit will work with minimal intervention and, and treat a lot of patients for, for, for a good price. So the, the finances, and this, this is where administration needs to, to, to buy in. It's not, just the up, it's not just the upfront costs of the construction and the equipment, but it's the ongoing costs of the service and the staff that really need to be understood and agreed upon. And, and there needs to be that institutional buy-in to, to continue to support a program. And, and here's the staffing again. We've, this has got five people. It's got, we've got a, a front office person. But knowing these, the, these finances up, up front and, and, and having the commitment to, to, to invest is important. So the, the imaging is, is really important. It's, it's kind of essential because it, does, it, does, it determines what type of program you're going to have. So historically, it's been performed with a planar radiography. So this, with a conventional SIM, or, or an x-ray. And these are, these are planar radiographs. You have an AP and a lateral. And you can see a tandem. And they're not, they're not ovoids, but you can essentially a TNO. And you, you see some rectal markers too. So they used to use these, and, and they still do in some places, to determine the, the treatment times and, and based on points, ICRU points. But we... We're moving beyond the, the planar radiography, but I, I don't want to I don't want to disparage it because it's it's old technology. It works. So if this is what you have, this is good. Obviously, uh, 3D planning is important and, and helpful, and CT simulators have, have been amazing for radiotherapy in terms of allowing us to to create complex uh, dose distributions and and to really treat less normal tissue. And, and here we actually, I hope you can see it. There's, a, there's, a, there's even a, a PTV drawn. So we've, we're moving beyond just treating to points. But we're actually looking at where is that dose going with 3D planning. And this, this is all soft tissue. So it's incredibly difficult to delineate that, that target from the normal tissue without something like an MR. And that's the, that's the new push, is to use magnetic resonance imaging to, to get better soft tissue contrast and to create these planning target volumes and actually truly create conformal brachytherapy doses rather than just using points. So the, the location and layout of your, your items really is going to have a major impact in, in, in your efficiency and, and your safety. So an efficient system is a safe system. So determining your layout, and, and, and you may be constrained with, with what you have, that's fine. But optimizing uh, the flow is, is very important because you want to minimize the movement of the patient once you put an applicator inside them. And with 3D planning, when you're, when you're, when you're picking a patient up and putting them on a CT table after you've put in an application, uh, applicator and then pulling them back off the table, uh, that can change it. And when we're talking about the, you know, 5CM, if uh, any little shift uh, can have a major uh, impact in a brachytherapy treatment. So the, the flow of the, of the facilities is important. So there, there are three major room layout options. There's one where you have a shared use of existing OR or procedure rooms, such as this. This is a typical, or used to be common, is to have your HDR unit in your simulator room so you can use the simulator for imaging and then treatment. And that's great for a planar treatment for, for just when you're using 2D. But if you want to use 3D, uh, you may have to move the patient. And so that's another option is, is, is a treatment room for the applicator insertion and, deli and treatment delivery, but you have them go to the CT unit to, to get imaged. And there are technolo technology solutions that help minimize the impact of, of that patient transfer. So this image, this, this Zephyr system, 
is actually like an air hockey table where it's blowing it's blowing air and it's 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 allowing the the the, the table essentially the the patient there's a little plastic there's a piece of plastic here that's that's supporting the patient but allows them to easily transfer without lifting and dropping just scooting over so there's there's less opportunity for the, uh, the applicator to be uh, dislodged or moved. A very re resource intensive option, and I think maybe the ideal um, is actually having an integrated brachytherapy suite where, you, where if you're doing a CT, you're, you're, you've got them on the CT table, you scan them on the CT table and you treat them on the CT table. Uh, that's something that, that you've got to consider um, the utilization. And, and maybe that CT unit would be better used for diagnostic procedures while you're doing that treatment. So it's something to consider, but I think that's kind of the, the, the optimal layout would be an integrated suite where you're not moving the patient at all. So this, this is a little bit, just a couple slides of physics about shielding. So the common method is to calculate the transmission using exponential attenuation. Unfortunately, you can't really use this in real life. You only use it on paper and for very, very uh, specific geometry, narrow beam geometry. In the real life, you've got to account for scatter. So these 100 photons in, 90 photons out, well, the truth is there's going to be some photons that interact in there. They're not going to be stripped out. They're actually just going to scatter back in. So. To account for that, that buildup or, of, of scatter, there are tables that are used to correct for it when you're doing your, your, your shielding calculation. And barrier transmission factors, which are, which are commonly used, they have the, the, that built up built, built into them. So they, they account for that um, additional or the accumulation of scatter. So the, the shielding equation, this is a simple shielding equation that should be common to many. So the barrier thickness, or, the, or actually the, the, the barrier transmission factor, which again, you, look, use a, you can use a lookup table for, equals the permissible dose times the distance squared over the workload, the usage, and the occupancy factor. Where the workload is, is how often is the, the unit in use. For a radioactive source, it's always in use. It's always on. So, but there may be different, there are different exposures from when it's out of the safe versus in the safe. So that's something the work, where workload could come in. Uh, the usage is, 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 this is, for, this is actually for a primary shielding for external beam. It's, it's how often is the beam directed at that wall, but for a radioactive source, it's isotropic. All walls are primary walls. So the usage factor is always one that falls out. And then the occupancy factor. So if, if you've got, if you're shielding for something on the other side of the wall, it, it, it matters who's there. If it's a radiation worker and if it's, and what type of room it is. If it's a, if it's a room where someone's sitting there all day long, 40 hours a week, that's a, that's a occupancy factor of one versus a, a room where it may be just a hallway. That permissible dose, it's, it's, it's based on the, the annual limits but it's scaled to weeks. It's scaled to the, to, the, to the weekly exposure. And sometimes for external beam, we scale it to the exposure in any one hour. But this is just, again, this is a, a brief introduction. There will be a um, much more in-depth discussion on this. So for brachytherapy, uh, a lot of this is, is simplified. It's, 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 it's not so, it, it's, it's much, more straightforward because it's a radioactive source. So NCRP 49 deals with shielding for, and NCRP is, is, a, is a US organization. It's the National Council for Radiation um, Protection, same as uh, or equivalent to ICRP, for the International Council for Radiation Protection. But they have a, a, a book that describes how to account for, uh, or how to shield for brachytherapy facilities and, and, and gamma in general. And by calculating this, 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 they have the, the barrier factor tabulated for different radioisotopes at different distances. And you can use that, this is to solve some problems. This has got an example problem where you wanna, you wanna know how thick 
the, the barrier needs to be at two meters from a 50 millicurie source. And this is how you would, you, would, you would look it up. You would find that two meters for that source, 0.77, and then scale the, the activity and you can get the thickness. That's very straightforward. And again, this is gonna, people are gonna go um, into more detail on this. I wanna bring up for Iridium-182, it's pretty standard. You know, the about 4 cm of lead or 35 cm of, of concrete is typical. For cobalt-60, again, the energy is higher. So there needs to be increased shielding. It's about an, an additional 15 centimeters of concrete for cobalt-60. So when you're planning for Iridium-182 or cobalt-60, these are, these are gonna play into your costs, but it, it's not, they're not too much different. 15, I'm not sure how much 15 cm of concrete costs though. So. Regarding security, high dose rate radioactive sources are, are, are in security group B by the, defined by the IAEA. And that, that outlines some, there's, there are some things that, that that requires. You've got to have a locked room, you've got to have access control to the room, a fixed container or device, and then the capability to detect removal or unauthorized access. And these are, these are broad generalizations from the IEAE. Your specific country or your, your specific regional authority may have stricter or typically not laxer, but they may have stricter requirements. And when the source is in use, there needs to be continuous surveillance. It needs to be in a controlled area. And again, there needs to be not just that it's, that it's, that it's contained, but that, there's, that there's, there's not just random people coming by. So there's access control as well. Only authorized personnel are, are, are permitted in there. But again, the, the big thing with the security is also controlled by your, your local codes and, and your local conditions. Because there, there, there are a lot of regulations. This is just for the US. There's the NRC who licenses the manufacture and disposal of radioactive sources. And then for us to get the, the sources transferred, and I, that, that's an upcoming um, topic. I think it might be the next one. It's transferring the, the sources. There, there, are regula- there are a lot of regulations around that. Uh, in the U.S., it's the Department of Transportation that, 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 that sets the rules for that. And then, then again, with us, it's, uh, it's NRC or an agreement state uh, that licenses the possession of it. In the U.S., the security of nuclear sources has increased, or the awareness of the need for security of them has increased. And they, we've done a lot to remove orphan sources and, and just really lock it down. I don't know how... Each individual country works with this, but this is this is something that needs to be um, understood before you get your force, first source. And with that, I'm done. But there are these are the key points from the regarding the new program. So having that awareness of the patient population, the staffing your staffing needs and your available facilities. What do you need to get started and and to maintain it? And then the costs and the benefits of each imaging technology. And again, that's a major selection. So be very thoughtful. And then location matters. Where you put the different elements is very important to the efficiency and the safety of your program. And that's it. I, I really appreciate you sharing or you sharing your time with me and allowing me to share some of my experience with you. This is, this is a pretty awesome program and I, I'm very happy to be involved with it. Uh, any questions, please? That's thank, it. thank you so much, Peter. So you covered a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. I don't know how you were able to fit all that in, but uh, you did a really good job. Thank you. And uh, while you guys are thinking of some questions, I'll, I'll say a couple as well. So I think Peter did a really good job stressing the importance of attention to detail in this brachytherapy program. You know, he talked about making sure that, you know, the applicator doesn't move when shifting the patient and and a number of other key topics. And I think that's really important. And this goes into the cost issue. So I find that a lot of hospital administrations and even radiation oncology departments tend to overlook HDR um, brachytherapy because it's so simple, right? It's just... uh, a little wire that's pushed out and pulled back in. A few moving parts, relatively not that expensive compared to some external beam equipment. And sometimes because of that, I feel that it's overlooked. 
But uh, um, remember, it has a sharp, sharp dose fall off, and we're able to give really, really high doses. So if you're going to give high, higher doses than you would with some stereotactic um, radiotherapy systems, then we should pay attention to the detail just as much. And this leads me into one other point. So again, Peter discussed um, in depth about imaging and the importance for imaging and how different types of imaging will affect what you can see, what you can contour, and so forth. And so this is important. So I know a number of your departments have different imaging um, capabilities. And so you, as physicists and doctors, need to discuss with each other and with hospital administration about the pros and cons of this. So if you have the possibility to go from um, 2D x-rays to CT, you need to stress to your hospital admin that this is really important. And likewise, if there are a couple of your centers I know that have access to MRI. So if you can go from CT to MRI, again, you can make drastic improvements. So with increase in technology, you can actually, and this will be covered later in another topic, but you can actually increase the five-year survival by up to 30 or 40 percent, um, depending on, on what sort of imaging and, and applicators and needles or whatever that you might be using. But a lot of that is heavily dependent on imaging. If you can get that drastic of an increase in survival going from 2D to, say, 3D with interstitial needles, if you have the capabilities and, and you're giving an MRI or you're giving a CT for external beam, that same care should be taken. In my, for me, that same care should be taken for brachytherapy. So uh, I think Peter did a really good job stressing that. And so this is something for you all to think about your, with your, amongst your department and with your hospital admin. And uh, again, a lot more imaging will be covered later in, uh, in um, further presentations. I have a question here that says, will, the slide, will we have the slides? Yes, I think the slides were already emailed to everyone. If they weren't, then we'll make sure that they are. Again, with the Zoom ID, another question, if we'll have the same Zoom ID for each meeting, maybe Samiksha can answer that for us. So we'll be sending out an email um, before, like a week before each meeting with the Zoom ID, but it should be a different one for each meeting. Thank you, Samisha. And I have one more question regarding the comparison between afterloaders. What is meant by max cycles? So max cycles, basically you have a number of times that the source can leave afterloader and come back in. So each time the source leaves the afterloader and comes back in, that's one cycle. So different manufacturers allow for different number of times that the source can leave and come back. So different number of cycles. I think it ranged from 5,000 up to 100,000 cycles for one of the Cobalt 60 units. And this is dependent on how the actual HDR machine is engineered. So with the Cobalt 60, which has the higher number of cycles, they've engineered it to be a little bit stronger because they know it has to last five years. But please don't exceed the number of cycles specified by the manufacturer because that's what leads to the possibility of malfunctioning and emergencies um, to happen. So, so strictly follow that uh, number of cycles and replace your source if you've reached the, the max number of cycles. Yeah, I, I think the, the most, most afterloaders record the number of cycles, so it won't let you exceed that. It, it's really there to and also to encourage PMIs. So it's, it's, it's important to take care of your unit. Okay, do we have any other questions? Uh, Samiksha, do you know when the next presentation is? I don't have it in front of me. The next, is it? I've forgotten off the top of my head. Next one is Tuesday, August 6th. So I believe that's next Tuesday, yeah, a week from now. Okay, great. So we will send you a reminder. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, thank you to, again, Peter, for the wonderful presentations. And uh, again, don't oh. hesitate to uh, email us questions as well. If you have questions between now and next Tuesday, we'll be happy to answer them for you. And the Zoom link actually is going to be the same one each week. 
Okay, yes. great. In order to make things simple, we've decided to use the same link for every single meeting. So if you were able to join today, you should be able to join for the others. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that, Ben. Okay, if there are no other questions, I know you all have busy schedules and we'll end the meeting now. Thank you, everyone, and thank you again, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Good night. All right. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.